Good morning and, and welcome to this program presented by the Eagleton Institute of Politics. My name is John Weingart. I'm Associate Director at the Institute. And this um, program this morning is uh, extending a tradition that began at Eagleton at least in the year 2000 and maybe before that. Uh, we started saying we're an Institute of Politics after all and that on the morning after the primary in 2000, we thought what we're all going to do is come in and gather over a coffee pot and talk about what happened in the election last year, last night. Um, why not uh, do it, you know, have some chairs and sit down and do it comfortably and invite other people in. And so we started a program we called the morning after, which, as I said, was in the primary of 2000. Um, in that year, uh, Bill Bradley had been running for president, but he'd already dropped out. So there was no real suspense there that Al Gore and George W. Bush were going to win the nominations. The real contest in New Jersey that year was for the Senate, U.S. Senate, and uh, former Governor Jim Florio was running against somebody named John Corzine for the Democratic nomination, and uh, Congressman Bob Franks and State Senator Bill Gormley were the major contenders for the Republican nomination. Um, the uh, Democratic contest by the time of the New Jersey primary that year had become so lopsided that uh, Al Gore's major opposition was Lyndon LaRouche, who picked up about 5% of the vote. So we had that program in the, in the spring of 2000. We then had did it again after the election in 2000, thinking the morning after the election, we'd know who won. And of course, we didn't for president for several weeks after that. But we've continued that uh, most primary, most state primaries and most state general elections to have some kind of program uh, the morning after. Um, I want to start by just remembering two people who were parts of these programs in various ways. Ruth Mandel was the director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics for over 20 years and worked there starting the Center on American Women in Politics starting in 1970. And she uh, stepped down as director last year and, and sadly passed away uh, this spring. Um, she was a, a, a fan of, of everything about Eagleton, including this program, these programs. And I also want to remember Nick Acachella, the uh, inventor and, and publisher and writer of PolitiFax, the weekly newsletter of, of New Jersey politics. Um, in one of his issue um, in advance of this program, one of these programs last year, he wrote that the Eagleton morning after is a bright star in the political firmament. So even though we're not in the same room and we're doing this remotely, we'll try to live up to uh, being a bright star of some sort in this program. Um, we have five uh, people, guests, uh, part of panelists here who have varying perspectives on, on politics and public policy in New Jersey and nationally. Um, in one case, having been an elected official um, at every level of government, in other cases, running nonprofit organizations and, and to reporters as well. Um, I'm going to introduce you, the panelists, one at a time and ask you each to talk a little bit about, uh, for a couple of minutes, about your impressions of, from the primary in particular and the impacts of the outcome, outcomes, and uh, any thoughts you want to add about where you think we are uh, politically and public policy sense and, and uh, in any other way um, to get us started. We'll then have some conversation among the panelists and uh, you people watching, I guess we're all watching at home, but people who are not on the panel are welcome to uh, submit questions and answers online and, and there's the chat box open and I will try as best I can to keep track of those and to, to work at least some of them into the conversation um, as we go along. Um, so I want to start, uh, first panelist and introduce Colleen O'Day. Um, it's her fault that we're doing this today and not doing it last Wednesday morning, which would have been the morning after the primary because she was far from alone in this, but she assured me that the votes would not be counted by last Wednesday morning and, and we would be living in suspense about who the Democratic nominee for uh, Congress in the second congressional district was. Um, of course, we learned that about 8.15 last Tuesday night, but nevertheless, we were all smarter a week later than we would have been then. Uh, Colleen is an award-winning longtime journalist based in New Jersey. She started her career at the record of Hackensack, worked in UPI's Trenton Bureau, 
and then spent most of her career at the Daily Record of Morris County. Uh, she left the Daily Record in, in 2011 and joined New Jersey Spotlight. She's currently a data and general assignment reporter with the online news site focused on state issues and, and analysis. In particular, she focuses on politics um, and lots of other issues, but politics is, is a main one. And she's also been tracking uh, information about COVID-19 the last couple of months and producing really uh, terrific um, terrifically informative graphics and uh, maps of the state and the incidence of disease and, and so forth. And I'd commend those to you. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Colleen, Colleen O'Day. You should unmike yourself. You need to unmike yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. And um, that is actually my first um, observation is um, don't make predictions uh, about elections. I should know that. I've been in New Jersey for a long time and I've been covering elections, but wow, I was, I couldn't, I can't tell you how shocked I was at about 8.15 on election night to see that suddenly someone had called the, uh, the second district uh, democratic race. And uh, one of the first thoughts I had was about the morning after and said, oh, gosh, what did I do to, to, to John Weingart and Eagleton? So I am sorry about that, but I hope we, we, have, a good, uh, we have a good discussion here today. Um, a few things I wanted to talk about, um, vote by mail. You know, vote by mail has been an issue that we've heard a lot about on, on the national level from, um, you know, Donald Trump and, and uh, you know, questions about about problems with it. And and certainly um, in the May 12th special elections that we had in New Jersey, we had some problems there. Um, this vote by mail didn't go off without a hitch. Um, we had some issues in terms of uh, ballots getting to folks and uh, we had uh, ballots getting sent back to folks instead of getting sent to the county board of elections, which was really odd. Um, we also had a, a postal truck in Morris County catch fire. Uh, it, so it, it ran the gamut, but ultimately I think the results are showing that vote by mail is something that people really like. Um, we had more than a million vote by mail ballots cast as of election night, and we're not sure yet how many in total we're gonna have, but certainly that's that's more than double the total we've had in the past. and. Um, I think what the lesson that we can take from this is that uh, if you send people a ballot and they don't have to put a stamp on it, they they might use it. You know, we we had a really good uh, vote by mail turnout, probably at least about um, 30 percent. So that is one thing that I think we need to look forward to. Um, I don't know what and I'm not going to make a prediction about this. I don't know what, um, you know, what Governor Murphy is going to decide for the November election, but it seems that um, vote by mail uh, or maybe an increased use of vote by mail is going to be part of that. Um, he, you know, he's he was very cautious in terms of this election and, um, you know, he he's talking about doing a whole postmortem about how the election process worked. So, you know, we'll see what he ultimately decides. Um, and, and the change in vote by mail also, uh, I think, leads to some changes in the way that campaigns um, need to, at least in New Jersey, because we're not used to this, need to operate. Um, I don't know that it would have made a difference, but we saw at the very end of the campaign in the second district, um, a, a mailer go out uh, paid for by general majority, uh, which was in favor of, which was backing uh, Bridget Harrison. Uh, that was, you know, kind of a, ne a negative um, Kennedy mailer. And the point is, when that goes out right before an election, but people have had their ballots for now weeks and most of them have sent them in, what's the point of that? You don't know how many people, and we still don't know how many people went to the polls on Tuesday. Um, but the the point is probably not enough to really influence what happens there. Um, so I think that campaigns need to kind of change the way that they're looking at how they're operating, when they're sending out their mailers, um, to to cope with 
a vote by mail election or primarily a vote by mail election. Um, and I, so that's my topic and I'm gonna pass it back to John and I look forward to, um, to talking more about the election. Thank you, Colleen. And just on that last point, the, the dates announced for the presidential debates uh, later this year, the final debate is October 22nd. So it's entirely possible in states with vote by mail, people could have cast their votes before that debate yeah. took place. Um, second, our second panelist I'd like to welcome is Michael Hill, correspondent and anchor with New Jersey TV News for the past six years. Michael is an award-winning news anchor and reporter with stints in New York, Dallas, New Orleans, and beyond. He uh, has covered some of the world's most memorable events over the last three decades, uh, topped prim prim probably by the New Jersey primary this year. And Michael Hill's interest in covering news runs the gamut and he feels right at home discovering and rediscovering his native New Jersey. He was student council president at Barringer High School, Barringer High School, where he ran track and played on the state champion winning, championship winning uh, football team. Michael has, was a national fellow at the USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism. And uh, it's delighted, delightful that you're here again with us. Uh, unmic, unmic your microphone, uh, unsilence your microphone and say, welcome. Your mic is still silent, oh, there you are. Welcome. Is that better? That's much better. All right, great. Hi, John, good morning, everybody. Uh, my, my impression was that uh, in talking to some of the election officials and county clerks is that, uh, uh, some of them uh, like this vote by mail and want uh, New Jersey to commit one way or the other. I know there are some state senators who are saying come November to go ahead and have the polls open. But, uh, for instance, the uh, elections uh, administrator in Union County, Nicole Dorado, had quite a few conversations with her. And her concern is that when you have this sort of hybrid election, even though most of it is supposed to be vote by mail, you still had thousands of people showing up at the polls to vote by paper provisional ballot. And she says uh, in those instances, there were people who were coming into the polling places who did not want to practice some of the protocols because of COVID-19, wearing a mask and so forth, and some of the poll workers as well. So her concern was this puts a lot of people in harm's way unnecessarily. Her advice has been if you have an election uh, and there's still concerns about COVID-19, then there should be no polling available in person. People should not be allowed to vote in person simply because of the potential danger. Her suggestion is to all vote by mail. And for folks who cannot vote by mail, those with disabilities, which is the reason the polls were open in, in, this, in this election, if you can't open the polls, then you should simply have vote by email as it uh, the state does and others do for those who are overseas. Um, Nicole also told me that uh, she's she's gotten a ton of provisional ballots, just a ton. People who had the option, not a lot of people knew this, had the option of still going to vote in person, and thousands of them did in Union County by paper provisional ballot. And she says that's just a nightmare. They have to start counting those after they count all the uh, mail-in ballots, which is sometime uh, this week, I believe. So uh, that's a lot more work, she says, on elections officials and election workers, and it's just really unnecessary. Her advice is simply close the voting booths, don't make them available anywhere to anybody, have it all vote by mail, and for those who can't vote by mail, simply have it where they can do it electronically, as it's done in other states, she says, for those who have disabilities and for those who are overseas. Uh, we visited the office there in Union County a couple of times. It was interesting to see behind the scenes this process of actually going through these mail and ballots and actually seeing how they make decisions about whether to rule a ballot in ballot or whether to keep it in and to have someone have an opportunity to, uh, to cure uh, the ballot. Uh, that was really interesting to see. So it's going to be interesting what the postmortem reveals for the governor and what his decision will be come November. But I know that there are some people out there in elections who are saying, look, do it one way or the other, but don't do it hybrid like this, where you mail out all these ballots and people are, are confused. And that's the other thing they said, too. Uh, some of the clerks and some of the elections officials are saying that, look, we just had very little time to educate the public about this. And it just lent itself to Christine Hammond, for instance, out of Monmouth County. The clerk just said it just lent itself to just 
hundreds of phone calls every day of voters confused about the process. Why did I get a mail-in ballot? What am I supposed to do with this? And they were really saying that we, we need to do a much better job if we're going to vote by mail in a process like this. So John, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people interested in, in offering information for a postmortem and see what that postmortem would lead to. Thank you, Michael. Um, the, the leading uh, election in, in, in press coverage and conversation and suspense in the primary was the second congressional district and that will probably in New Jersey and that probably will be the case in November as well. That wasn't always the case. Frank Lobiondo represented that district for 24 years and uh, the fact that he got reelected every two years was, was just expected. Um, Frank has been elected to office in the, on the county, state, and federal levels since 1984. In Congress, he was a senior member of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for more than two decades, and uh, um, is now the founder and CEO of Lobo Strategies, an independent consulting firm. Congressman, we're delighted to have you with us this morning. Welcome. Thank you. Your mic is clear. Okay. Good morning, John, uh, to fellow panelists and those who are participating. Uh, thank you very much for uh, asking me to be involved. And I want to start off, though, by saying that um, the Eagleton Institute uh, is something near and dear to me for a reason that some people may not know. And that is when I was first decided to run for Congress, there was a distinguished individual, some of you may remember his name, Steve Salmar. Um, and Steve was an incredible political genius who consulted for me, advised me, helped me. And in that year, uh, I had a very contested primary with a state senator where I was given no chance of winning. And Steve Salmar's genius is what sort of pulled it through. But um, this is uh, all the focus on the second congressional district is pretty amusing. Uh, <laughs> uh, thinking back to, to my days and what this all means. So there are a couple for the insiders. There are a couple big takeaways. When uh, Jeff Van Drew decided that he was going to switch parties and there are a variety of reasons that people attribute to that. Obviously, the, the Democrats uh, got themselves pretty exercised as I don't think it was a surprise for anyone. And uh, Bridget Harrison jumped in immediately and received uh, a tremendous support from uh, Democratic Party leaders and uh, a political behind the scenes um, giant here in South Jersey, George Norcross. And it was expected since she had the line in every county that she was just going to walk through this thing because as most of us know, if you've got the line, that makes a big difference. Well, lo and behold, Amy Kennedy decided that uh, months later that she wanted to get involved. And uh, Atlantic County being the largest of the counties in the second congressional district, uh, or some arguably uh, would say politically the most powerful, uh, she was able to win Atlantic County. But what was really surprising is that she won every county. And how you do that when you're not on the line, I'm not quite sure. So there are a number of factors. Uh, obviously, the Kennedy name is very well known. Uh, she's lived here all of her life, and uh, she presents herself extremely well. Her father was involved as a local councilman uh, for a lot of years. I'm not sure if he still is. Uh, very well respected uh, as a teacher, an educator, uh, someone involved with mental health issues, she struck all the right chords. And uh, I have to tell you, I really don't know Bridget Harrison, but in the time I was a member of Congress, I prided myself on going to every breakfast and barbecue and every time the brownies were baking cookies. I don't think I ever met Bridget Harrison anywhere. So I think that had an effect. Uh, because here in South Jersey, I think it's a little bit different than the northern part of the state. I think that had an effect on uh, voters and what they saw and how they figured that out. But there are also some other very intriguing factors in Atlantic County. There's a very colorful character with a checkered past by the name of Craig Calloway, 
who specializes in messenger ballots and vote by mail, and he goes out for hire. And uh, I understand that Bridget Harrison wanted to hire him, but he was not interested, didn't particularly like her for some reason, signed on with Amy Kennedy. Now, if it had been a close election, people would say that made the difference. Uh, it was not a close election. So as we move into uh, the November election, which is a short time away, uh, the traditional things that a candidate that I would look at of how you solidify your base, how you get out the vote, that is all going to change. And I have clients that are asking me, uh, Lobo strategy clients that are asking me about what to look for, to expect. And the answer is expect the unexpected. There can be things changing probably every five minutes from what we saw before. A lot depends nationally on what happens with President Trump, uh, what, ha what happens with the economy. And I think we're going to see some real surprises here. Election unfolds in the second congressional district. Okay, I'm not sure if you got frozen. Hello. Yep. Here. Okay. Okay. So I'll cut it off there, but be happy to chat more with either panelists or folks who have questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, the next panelist is Marilyn Davis. Um, Marilyn, Marilyn worked at the Democratic National Committee as the National Director of Community Engagement, where she led a team responsible for engaging stakeholders in the African-American, Hispanic, AAPI, Jewish, LGBT, youth, women, ethnic, veterans, rural, organized labor, and small business communities in electoral politics and civic engagements. That's most people, I think, were in there somewhere. <laughs> she served in the Obama-Biden administration as a political appointee at the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, and as deputy director of the Office of Public Engagement, she managed labor and African-American outreach. Um, Marilyn Davis, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate today. And, and hello to my other fellow panelists. Um, the, the downside to being the, the third person to speak is that people take your topic. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely want to touch on um, the vote by mail um, uh, topic one, and also certainly uh, CD2, because I think there's some points that, that still need to be raised. Um, on the vote by mail side, I think it was it's interesting to note is in talking to my fellow political operatives, um, their their assessment of, of the of the June prime or the July primary is that vote by mail was a success. Um, we are certainly waiting to see uh, what happens when the vote by mail um, ballots are certified this week uh, to see what that looks like. Um, but according to insiders, they they. They've seen nearly a million vote by mail come in. Um, about 874,000, give or take, have been um, deemed uh, uh, good, if you will. Um, but they think they're going to cross over to a million BBMs, which will be huge and huge for the governor's narrative on how successful um, the vote by, mail, um, vote by mail effort was in the state. But there is some concern among, especially legislators, about people being disenfranchised um, and how to ensure that going forward, especially for November, that we make sure that um, especially African-American um, and Latino communities, that their votes are counted and they have an opportunity to uh, participate in the process. Interestingly enough, I think it's worth noting that um, the African-American participation by a vote by mail in this primary season increased. Typically, you will see around 17%, give or take. Um, it looks like the, the African-American participation rate has been, was at around 25%. Um, I think, interesting enough, the Latino participation was lower than normal. Normally, they're around 16 to 17%, but this year, they're between 11 and 12%. Um, and there are, I, th I think that is an area of concern um, and an area that certainly uh, should be um, zeroed in on in the coming weeks to see what happened. Um, was it the application process? The application was a little confusing to me, and I'm an operative. Um, so it wouldn't be surprised to, that, that others who may have language issues um, may have had some issues as well. So I think there is, that's, some, that's an area that we should definitely do a, a deeper dive to see what 
um, is the reason for the lack of, um, of turnout uh, in, in both communities in particular, but certainly the, the Latino community. And as one who has worked on campaigns across the country, um, where I have worked on campaigns in Florida, for instance, where they have early voting, um, I think we should explore opportunities for people to actually go into a, um, a voting facility and vote be before election day beyond the BBMs so that while we have this opportunity where um, COVID is, is it, it appears that it's, it's on a decline and although there's speculation that in the fall and the winter it will return or, and return with a vengeance but while we have this window let's create a space for people to actually start participating now and go in person and vote for those who are most comfortable in that in that space because there's a huge education component to vote by mail that wasn't recognized in the primary season that we need to take into account and provide opportunities for for those who are who are accustomed to voting in person uh, can, can can have those rights protected as well as making sure that the workers as as michael referenced earlier the workers are protected as well um so I, i'm a big advocate for early voting um, and also an advocate for making it convenient to people who are have busy scheduled and want to vote by mail. But we have to remove the barriers. Um, the second point I want to raise is the, the CD2. I think it's worth noting. Um, I, I'm, I'm really surprised that people did not foresee uh, Amy Kennedy winning. And, and we've seen this historically, not only in New Jersey, but nationally. Surnames do make a difference. In New Jersey, I'll use um, the, the congressional race that Donald Payne Jr. was in when his primary, when his dad um, transitioned. Uh, we saw the surname work, right? We've seen the surname work even nationally. Um, I just think of some, some national races where uh, there's some nasty races. Um, I'm trying to think of some. Uh, we have, uh, I would say, Kilpatrick in, in, in Michigan. I think it was uh, that the family name was pretty strong there. Um, so it wasn't a surprise when, when they won there. Uh, uh, it, it escapes me some of the names, but we've seen that surnames do, do work. Um, and the Kenny name certainly, it, 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 the Kenny name is, is up there with like Mother Teresa, right? So again, it's not a surprise that, that Amy Kennedy won. I think what and traditionally, I would say, ha having worked on Capitol Hill uh, uh, when Congressman Lobiondo was there, traditionally, I would say this is absolutely going to be um, a, a Republican seat in the general. Um, but I think what makes this race unique this year is the amount of attention that it's receiving because of um, Congressman Jeff Andrews switching parties. In particular, I think the DCCC is going to pour a lot of money into that race because Speaker Pelosi has an axe to grind here. So you have Speaker, o Speaker Pelosi with an axe to grind, and you have the Kennedy name. And as Congressman Lobiana pointed out earlier, you also have a good person, right? You have a good person. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of resources being poured into CD2 nationally. Um, and a lot of attention to take uh, Congressman Banjo out as a way to um, to exert uh, um, retribution on him for switching parties. And on that note, I will end and turn it back over to you, John. Okay. Thank you, Marilyn. I know in, in this kind of conversation, it's inevitable that we, use, we all use shorthands that we and probably most people watching this um, understand. I just want to Note that CD2 is the congressional district in one of the, in a congressional district in southern New Jersey. Um, it uh, includes uh, parts of eight, eight counties, one, two, three, four, seven counties in, in southern, southern New Jersey, but that's what we're referring to. Um, next, I'd like to call on Brandon McCoy. Brandon is the uh, president, chief executive of New Jersey Policy Perspective. He's worked for that organization for five or six years in shaping policy debates to advance economic justice. Um, he, uh, his research interests include state tax policy, minimum wage, paid sick leave, the earned income tax credit, urban planning, and criminal justice. Brandon, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Thank you, John and Eagleton, uh, for the opportunity to be here. 
uh, as a Blousey alum, I definitely appreciate all the things that Eagleton represents uh, in the state of New Jersey as a Jersey boy, um, of course. And so it's really an honor to be here with you all. Um, I think the the reaction and sort of the the frame I have on this election so far has just been the everlasting power of the line. Um, you know, a lot a lot of people thought that vote by mail would create a scenario where you know the line wouldn't be as uh, influential uh, due to people being able to sit at home and take their time with their ballot. <clears throat> um, excuse me, but taking two different races as examples, both congressional district two with uh, Amy Kennedy and Bridget Harrison and Con Congressional District 4 with Christine Conforti and Stephanie Schmidt, uh, we can see that New Jersey's unique ballot design still has a major impact on how people vote and the outcomes of elections. So for Congressional District 2, you know, as of yesterday, when we last checked these numbers, um, Amy Kennedy is winning all eight counties, but her percentage of the total vote varies by nearly 33 percentage points, depending on where you look, depending on where the line is. So in Gloucester County, where Bridget Harrison had the line, Amy Kennedy got 45.9, basically 46% of the vote. But in Atlantic County, where Amy Kennedy herself had the line, she got 78.5% of the vote. So that's a, that's a huge swing. Uh, in the three uh, CD2 counties where either Amy Kennedy had the line or no one had the line at all, she's winning 75% of all votes cast. And then the five CD2 counties where Bridget Harrison had the line, Amy Kennedy is winning just 52% of all the votes cast. So even though, you know, she sort of overcame not having the line in a majority of the counties, where she did have the line, she had a significantly higher percentage of the vote and where she didn't, she had a significantly lower percentage and it still makes a big, big difference. And then, you know, same thing in CD4, Christine Conforti and uh, Stephanie Schmidt both appeared on the line in Mercer County, but Conforti was listed first. Uh, and then Schmidt had the line in Monmouth and Ocean County. So in Mercer County, uh, Conforti is beating Schmidt by 25 percentage points, uh, but Schmidt is beating Conforti by 55 and 63 percentage points in Monmouth and Ocean, where she had the line. So the only substantive difference is who had the line in each county. That's 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 the major theme here. And I think one interesting point here is that both Conforti and Schmidt were on the line in Mercer. Um, and so that appears to have led to a sizable overvote. Um, it seems that up to about maybe 30% of all the ballots could cast there, could be disqualified maybe, just because you have people who are used to voting down the line and they voted for both candidates. And so this is another scenario where, you know, New Jersey's unique ballot design uh, is really a feature less than a bug uh, and it leads to outcomes that, uh, you know, I think are, are favorable to incumbents, but in spaces where incumbents don't exist, it still allows parties to have uh, great influence over the eventual victor. So, you know, in addition to all the news and all the interesting things that everybody before me has already pointed out with regards to the drama in CD2, um, you know, we haven't really spoken about um, the, the race between uh, Krybich and Gottheimer yet, but even that was an interesting race to see how that moved forward. Um, it's just, I think a lot of folks are looking for leadership, you know, these days. Uh, they're looking for candidates who are going to make them believe and, and who are going to make them comfortable that they actually have a sense of what they're doing. And in the experience that everybody's having right now and having to stay at home, having to go through this pandemic, having to do so in a way um, where they don't really know what the end game is because it's very unclear what the national strategy is. I think that had a major impact on how candidates ran their races, uh, how they sort of presented themselves. Uh, and also who ended up being the victor at the end of the day. It was basically people were trusting, okay, you're going to go to Washington and you're going to be able to represent me and my family in a way where I actually trust that you have a sense of what you're doing. And, you know, I think in pa years past, that might have been a low bar to pass, but right now it's, a, it's, a, it's the most important bar that people are looking for. Thank you, Brandon. Um, our, our fifth final panelist is Patricia Campos Medina. Welcome. Patricia is a nationally recognized labor and political leader with more than 20 years experience on grassroots and labor organizing, electoral campaigns with a senior government relations and senior organizational management record. She also has electoral and public sector campaign experience, having worked for many national and local campaigns, including Obama for America in 2008 in New Jersey and uh, former Governor John Corzine's reelection campaign in 2009. Um, she was a member of the Booker for Senate campaign teams and served on the transition teams of former Governor Corzine, Mayor Cory Booker, and President Obama. 
and is considered an expert on labor, trade, and immigration policy. Uh, Patricia, welcome. You need to unmute your mic. Okay, here it is. I thought I had done it. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Um, I, I think that in addition to what my fellow colleagues have um, shared about the elections, I wanted to focus on on the area that keeps me awake <laughs> at night as a, as a resident of New Jersey, and is how are we engaging um, Latino voters and immigrant community and, and poor working class uh, voters in our urban communities. So, um, you know, we we had this exper experiment of vote by mail, and I think that given the circumstances of our health crisis and, and COVID-19, this was the right thing to do. Um, so looking at the outcomes, um, final outcomes, I think it's important to evaluate who actually um, turned out to vote. And I agree with Mar Marilyn that there was better than expected in terms of, of the turnout of, of over 1 million ballots. But I, I want to dig into what, who, who are those voters. Um, and, and reflecting on the low turnout of Latino voters uh, filling uh, returning ballots, we, hopefully the trend change once we, we finally get the final numbers. Uh, but to me, it reflects, um, as an activist, um, it reflects um, the lack of investment in voter education uh, on our, our working class communities, uh, the lack of investment on educating immigrant voters about what does it take to, uh, to understand the process of vote by mail. And that I think is just um, a problem that we have on how elections, primary elections are, are structured for loyal voters to participate, which are usually young, older voters, right? So I think that moving forward, we have to figure out um, how do we solve the problem of who, how we are doing the voter mobilization and voter education, uh, who is doing that outreach? Um, because in order to change the trends, um, it's not just the Democratic Party or the Republican Party uh, that has to do it, it's organizations that care about voter engagement and keeping our democracy alive. I mean, we at Lupe, uh, Latin United for Political Empowerment, our interest is always how do we increase the participation of Latino voters. Now, I want to put on a statistic that I think should drive our discussion about how do we engage more voters in the electoral process in New Jersey. New Jersey um, is one of, uh, of 10 states where the biggest growth of immigrant voters has happened in the last 10 years. Uh, and that growth has happened with Latino voters and Asian voters. So we also have to focus on the on Asian voters. How are they engaging? Who's talking to them? Um, and how are, if not the political parties, how are organizations who are interested in increasing voter engagement are going to invest in the process of voter mobilization? So that's what I want to focus this discussion because um, I think that that requires investment or resources of, of, of reaching out or the working poor in our, in, our, in our urban cities, of engaging younger voters. And, and, um, and because there wasn't a diversity of candidates in this primary election, perhaps didn't engage as much as they should have. Um, so we sort of uh, had to step back and say, uh, and, and, and really dig into what, uh, who is voting um, and how do we invest resources in voter mobilization in both the Latino community in the Asian community, because it's not happening and it's, and it's shortchanging our ability to drive um, uh, policy changes that are impact those communities. So I stop there. I hope we can engage in that discussion uh, about what political parties are not doing to engage those communities. And I want to say, because Congressman Lloyd Biondo is here, and I think that we missed the times of the Republican Party where there was actually a competition for Latino voters. Um, you no, know, when there was a, a Republican Party that was that was willing to listen to Latino and immigrant voters, there was more of an interest from Democrats to engage and mobilize Latino voters than there is today. And, and, and that might be good for those who focus only on increasing politics, uh, uh, party, polit party power. But for those of us who are interested in, in pushing for policy reforms, 
the lack of a middle of the road Republican Party is a problem because there's just um, this assumption that uh, Demo uh, Latinos are just stuck voting against Donald Trump and there's no need to do anything else. So thank you. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you all. I want to start out from where you ended up, Patricia, and also um, uh, bearing in mind uh, Congressman Lobiando's uh, phrase that we should expect the unexpected. Um, the unexpected in recent months um, certainly includes the, the COVID pandemic, includes the, the killing of George Floyd and, and the response to that, and, and the effect of COVID on the economy. And I wonder, um, Benny, you would like to jump in on how you see those events, um, the impact of those events, maybe on politics and campaigns, but also any at least short term effects on policy at the Trenton or Washington level? It's an easy question, I know. <laughs> well, but can I just jump in? I just feel like one of the key components of this election is that nothing changed in terms of power and, and dynamics. We might see a change in South Jersey, but in terms of power dynamics and who drives policies, is up for grabs, and we'll see what happens till November. Mm -hmm. It certainly seems to me that um, the the response to COVID is going to be a um, uh, an issue in November because it's been an issue so far in terms of uh, voters and how they feel about um, you know how actions have been taken in the states as well as at the national level. So I think it's going to definitely have an impact on um, on how voters vote. I've I've heard from clerks in some counties that are very red that um, uh, there are a lot of Republicans out there who are unhappy with, um, you know, with the way COVID is being handled um, on a national level. So I, I can jump in. I want to address both points that you raised, one about COVID and two about George. Um, one on COVID. So, so traditionally, New Jersey in a presidential election is a feeder state, right? We're considered an exporter state into Pennsylvania naturally. In a COVID environment, that restricts our movement and our ability to, to, to help enhance the ground operation in Pennsylvania in particular. So without those resources, in a state that's already um, uh, unpredictable, which is why it's a battleground state, it further exacerbates the situation. So traditionally, New Jerseyans would get on a bus, go to Pennsylvania, go to um, streets in Philadelphia and, and talk to voters and try to turn out the vote. In a COVID environment, that's not going to happen. And so if you're relying on making phone calls, calling to states to say, come out and vote, that's going to be really limited because most people don't have landlines. And unless you, somehow they've collected your mobile numbers, that's going to be limited, right? So even communicating with the hard to reach voters are gonna be difficult in a, in a COVID environment. So now everything is happening online in a virtual environment. And I'll say if you, New Jersey is an example here, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't see any advertising on social media for the upcoming primary. I haven't seen a lot of online advertising in general for down ballot races. I've seen some for um, the, the presidential, but not the congressional races in particular. So I think that relying on uh, a virtual campaign in, a, in an environment where we have a digital divide is not gonna fare well for Democrats. So if we are relying on um, traditional uh, campaign tactics in a non-traditional environment, I think we're gonna come up short. I, I will take Colleen's advice and I won't make a prediction but I will say that it will definitely be a challenge for us. Um, and I'm gonna speak for, as a Democrat, having worked for the Democrat National Committee, um, it's gonna be a challenge for the party. Now, dealing with George Floyd's death, I think that uh, the, there has been, we've seen more protests since George Floyd's death than we've seen in the history of this country. And on one level, I think that's a good thing, because um, now there's a more awareness and awareness of the connection between um, protests and policy. On the flip side, I think that um, there also is a high sensitivity on the part of the white community in that 
um, the white community feels under attack. And what do you do when you're under attack? You retreat. And when you, you retreat to what is most comfortable. And I think we're in an environment now that could go both ways and that if the white community is now faced with self-preservation, that will not go well for Democrats. And the young people who are out here protesting don't um, take action at the ballot because the policies seem so um, uh, insurmountable, then we're going to have a problem in November. And then overlay all of that with COVID. I think we got a problem. <laughs> we okay. Yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to go to uh, uh, the points that uh, Marilyn was making about uh, campaigning in an environment like this. When uh, eight fifteen last week, uh, last Tuesday, eight twenty. Excuse me a minute, Mike. Okay, everyone, um, might mute their mics when you're not talking. Cause it's just the background feedback. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And when you know eight thirty or so rolled around, and it was clear what the projection was for Amy Kennedy. I got on the phone and talked to a political operative in, in South Jersey, and he said to me that uh, Kennedy ran such a smart campaign in this particular environment when you couldn't get out to meet people because of uh, the restrictions and so forth. And uh, and we had this conversation. I said, "Well, so she used you know social media well." He said, "Well, you know, it, it was it was much more than that. It was much more basic than that." And I said, "So what are you talking about?" He said. Amy Kennedy won this race in part because of how she used television. He said, you could not turn the TV on, on some of these uh, political shows and other, other shows on TV and not see an Amy Kennedy ad. He said that this campaign ran such an effective TV campaign that if, if you didn't know Amy Kennedy and she was walking down the street, you would immediately say, that's Amy Kennedy. So it was interesting to hear that perspective. And um, and the impact come uh, November is going to be interesting because, again, people are, uh, while the weather is warm, people are still pretty much uh, shut in or, or, or exercising and um, practicing some of the protocols and all. But uh, somebody also mentioned uh, money, I think it was Maryland in this race, and this operative told me, expect this to be one of the most expensive political races in the country, certainly for a house seat, uh, and expects about $30 million to be spent uh, when it's all said and done. That's a very expensive campaign for a, uh, for a house seat. To, um, to Michael's point about uh, television ads, I, I, I agree, and I, I don't really watch television as much, and I think it's going to be an interesting thing to see how that impacts different parts of the voter base and the electorate, um, because just the way that you know millennials and people who are younger sort of receive media and news and information is really through, you know, YouTube, online, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, you know, Instagram, and I think a lot of people sort of hear that and say, well, that's not real, real media. Well, real media is moving to those platforms, so it is still real media. It's just not television. And if a lot of the focus is going to remain on television ads, uh, that's going to have a different impact on that portion of the electorate. And if, if, if certain parties are going to rely more on younger voters, that's a more disparate um, sort of landscape of reaching them. There's not one medium or two mediums where you know everybody's at. It's a variety of different mediums across platforms. That's a more expensive proposition. And I think it just doubles down on the fact that no matter what we're talking about here, it still seems that candidates who have deep pockets are the ones that are going to be uh, set up for success no matter what. And I want to speak here because I think that most of the political analysis in New Jersey focuses on how much money a campaign spends on media uh, rather and doesn't, uh, which attracts the same uh, usual voters that uh, candidate most turn out to win, uh, but it never really goes deep into how do you mobilize young voters, how you mobilize new voters in New Jersey, and there's no real money spent in there uh, from either candidates or the, or the political parties. And I think that's the disconnect, uh, because if you want to engage young voters who are most likely not one or two voters, 
If you're going to engage new registered voters that are perhaps immigrants, which are probably three or four, um, they only come out when a validators from their community ask them to vote. So, uh, or when they hear somebody that looks like them asking them to vote. So investing on that level of targeted voting, it needs a long-term commitment to building a different kind of electorate in New Jersey. And we haven't seen it from political parties in New Jersey. And I think that if we focus on just how much money um, Amy Kennedy spent on media, then we miss the, and we miss the point that Marilyn is mentioning is how do we engage and energize young voters and new voters to participate in New Jersey politics? Are we going to keep having the repeat of who turns out is the same people? And maybe for some portions of New Jersey political establishment that works, but our elector is changing in New Jersey and we sort of have to, um, you know, demand better in terms of how we are spending resources of political mobilization. Who is it going to? Uh, are we spending on a voter education or how to vote by mail? I mean, there's a big disconnect on our communities of color. They don't understand the process of vote by mail and it varies depending on your education level. So if you're an educated Latino, you might get a ballot and read all the instructions. If you're a working class Latino who has three jobs, is a frontline worker, you don't have time to, to read that ballot. So who is reaching out to that frontline worker who is worried about working and being, getting sick about in, turn, return that ballot? That investment is not happening. I think we need to challenge that model uh, for November. Let me uh, read two of the comments that have come in from people watching this, because one of them is, is right on point with what you were saying. Which is uh, we at the League of Women Voters have tried to use social media to connect, particularly to young people. Is there a particular way that we could message to disenfranchised communities that you would recommend? And I don't, we don't have time here to get into a detailed discussion about that, but maybe we should connect some of you after that. And the other comment um, is polls can only sh polls can only show more or less what voters plan to do, assuming their votes are counted. What do panelists expect with regard to voter suppression, technical problems with voting, and other issues uh, related to actually getting votes tallied? So I throw those out into the into the discussion. Um, Congressman Lobiano, do you want to jump in on any of these questions? You, Mike, you're muted. The, nor the northern part. Okay, we on. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure in the northern part of the state, but. And uh, in sort of my part of the political world, which is which is roughly uh, a third or a little bit more geographically of the state of New Jersey, uh, I don't sense or see any voter suppression. Now, that's we hear about that in other states, and we have concrete examples. Uh, we have problems, to be sure, but I don't think that's one of them. But this uh, whole thing is so new, what does it mean and how do voters communicate and how do the candidates communicate? Where do they spend their money? They're, each of these candidates, uh, Congressman Van Drew and Amy Kennedy, are going to have pretty deep pockets. The war chests are going to be pretty filled up. A lot of this will depend on how smart the consultants are and their ability to slice and dice and where to put those dollars. So as was pointed out, uh, Amy Kennedy really swamped the airwaves. But let me tell you, Bridget Harrison, uh, she was no slouch when it came to TV either. She had a lot of TV ads. Um, now, I can't speak too much on the third district, uh, where that's a, a whole other separate problem with, with Richter, who is, uh, just moved into the district, but he's got a deep pocket, and Andy Kim. Uh, we'll see some of those. But here in the 2nd Congressional District, um, I think a lot is going to hinge on uh, the good advice that's or bad advice that's going to come from a consultant to a candidate. Because as a candidate, you have an instinct. You have an instinct of where your base is and what you do and how you do it. So for me, it was going to every barbecue there was and every breakfast there was. You can't do that anymore. Uh, you can't do it in the same way. So how connection with those voters that you're going to rely on, uh, not just your party base. And, and here in the second congressional district, uh, while it may, may lean red, uh, it's still got a lot of independent voters. And how do you connect 
And that's going to be a whole new challenge that somebody's going to have to figure out in the next 100 days. Yeah, I want to jump in and, and kind of comment on what the congressman is um, saying. There really has to be a different way to um, to to campaign in these days. And I think that that influenced uh, a lot of what happened uh, when we're looking at results in certainly in the second. Um, but also, I wanted to touch on the third, which we really haven't talked about and that that is another kind of key race. Um, when you're, uh, you, you know, you had David Richter, as the congressman pointed out, who recently moved into the district. Um, he, he, in fact, had planned to run against uh, Van Drew. Um, but then when Van Drew switched to the Republican Party, he decided, well, maybe I'm not going to win. So I'm going to move to the third. Um, and he ran against Kate Gibbs. Uh, this just kind of shows another change in um, the electorate. You know, it used to be that that doing something like that, like being a, a you know a so-called carpetbagger and just moving into a district, even though that's allowed, um, would have you know would have not won you a race. But in recent years, I think we've seen more and more that voters don't seem to care about that. Um, Tom MacArthur won in the third district before Andy Kim beat him, and Tom MacArthur was from Randolph. Um, in the eleventh, we actually have two candidates, both the Democrat and Republican, who neither of whom currently lives in the 11th district. Um, it's just an it's just an odd thing that we hadn't um, really seen before, I think, voters uh, embracing in elections. I just a, I, I grew up in New York City in in the 1960s when Robert Kennedy sort of moved into the state of New York and got elected to the US Senate. So there are exceptions to that. But again, yeah. it points to the Kennedy name even back then. Uh, and if I yes, just, Marilyn, yes. Two um, issue, questions raised. One on social media and how to get to the hard to reach voters. I, I said I would suggest that um, the League of Women Voters meet them where they are. Go to those um, uh, platforms, whether it's TikTok or Instagram, where these individuals are, and also connect with the people who influence them. So there are these influencers, whether it's a YouTube influencer or an influencer on Instagram connect with them and have them communicate to their audience to support um, your program. Um, and, and the second point on voter suppression. I worked at the DNC during the time uh, when the, the Russians hacked the Democratic Party. Um, and and the, certainly there's evidence that there was voter suppression. I don't think that will be an issue here in New Jersey. Voter suppression will not be the issue. The issue will be disenfranchisement. And so, so the, the, the issue for the day for the for the, the the governor and the party leaders, how do we make sure that voters um, want to receive the education they need to understand what is happening, um, when they can vote, how they can vote, and then ensure that there's a, a, a mechanism in place to turn out the vote. So I think that is the that should be the focus for all who are concerned about making sure that um, if the, the incumbents stay in office or those who are. Challenging incumbents are successful. Hey, John, uh, this is Frank. Can I jump in again for a quick minute? Please, please do. Yeah. Um, you know, to what Colleen was speaking about, if we move to the third district, just a slight correction for those of us who are sort of the political junkies and the insiders. David Richter did not just decide to move to the third district. There was enormous enormous behind the scenes pressure. He spent a lot of time initially attacking Jeff Van Drew after uh, Van Drew switched parties. And Richter had every intention of attempting to run in the second congressional district uh, until, you know, there's there's sort of an old saying, uh, when people feel the heat, they see the light. Well, I think he felt some heat and he saw the light and the third district was the next opportunity. Okay, thanks. Um, some of the other comments that have come in. Um, well, well, for one thing, uh, Brandon, you might want to say something about a New Jersey policy perspective report and, uh, that goes into issues around the lines and in, in on the ballot and explain some of the background to that. You want to mention that just so people can find it if they want it? For sure. Um, if you go to our website, njpp.org, uh, our latest report is called Towing the Line. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, the subtitle is New Jersey primary ballots enable party insiders to pick winners. And basically it's about 
is looking at how New Jersey's ballots, the design of them are uniquely different from ballots in the rest of the country, you know, from any other state in the nation. Uh, the way that we design our ballots are that we sort of uh, put candidates for um, office in different columns based on, uh, and the party gets to decide who has what column. So when we when folks say the line, they mean you know column A usually or whichever line it is that every um, favored candidate in that party is going to appear in that column together so that it's more likely that people will vote down that column and pick everybody in that line. So I think when I was looking at one of the um, one of the one of the ballots in the CD2 race, there were a few uh, ballots where Amy Kennedy was all the way in like column L or something off in what we call ballot Siberia, where you know you really had to look to find her. If you wanted to vote for Amy Kennedy, you had to go all the way down to the side of the ballot to vote for her. Uh, and Bridget Harrison was in column A or B, along with every other candidate uh, for other for other offices for other races down that line. And so. Um, that that creates a scenario where, you know, for folks who are low information voters or haven't been paying attention for which, you know, there's so much going on these days that it's 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 fair for people to not be paying attention to every nook and cranny of detail of information about a race. You know, you just see, oh, all these people are together. They must they must know each other. They must know one another. They must be friends. They must be all running together. I'm just going to vote down the line here. And that has a major impact on sort of, you know, the outcome of elections and how, you know, who gets who gets votes. Um, and so the, my comments earlier about sort of the, the swing and how much support Amy Kennedy saw, depending on whether or not she was on the line in the county versus not, is indicative of that fact. And we'll definitely be following up this congressional race, uh, sort of looking you know, once there's still some precincts that are reporting. Uh, not every precinct has finished uh, reporting its figures, but once it does, once we have 100 percent reporting from all precincts, we're going to look at the impact of the line on this race. And compared to past races, just because we want to see if vote by mail had much of a change on, on this election. But when you look back at past races and past congressional governor's races, you know, whatever it may be, may mayoral races for sure, the line has a major impact and allows the party to have a big influence over the eventual winner in primaries particularly. Yeah, I was just going to point out here too, as as Brandon noted, not only are we still waiting for some vote by mail ballots to be counted, but we haven't even started counting the provisional ballots of all of those folks who voted in person last Tuesday. So while um, we can tell that the results are not going to be any different from what they, you know, what they show today in terms of winners, um, the the margins could be could be significantly different. So, and I, I do think it gives us an, um, you know, an interesting window into seeing if there was a difference between vote by mail versus those who voted in person in, you know, in, in races like the second. Buddy, um, <clears throat> Colleen, at the outset, you mentioned uh, Governor Murphy sort of evaluate, planning to evaluate how this primary went and how paper ballots worked and so forth. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know if others do, is there a structure behind that? Is there a, is, is it a process or is he, does anyone know the process that's going to go on to evaluate the election? And obviously there isn't a, a lot of time to do it in a way that would be meaningful for the, the November election. So if I can be cynical here, which is my job as a journalist, um, I'm not sure that there's any kind of real, um, you know, official way that this is going to happen. I mean, the governor has already said in the last week that he thinks that things went pretty well. He he, he wants to reserve final judgment. But, you know, I think that as we've gone through COVID, too, and we've seen talk about, you know, we're going to look at this or we're going to evaluate that, there often doesn't seem to be at least any kind of, um, you know, official process that is being shared with us uh, journalists or with the public. Um, you know, we've we've heard talk about, you know, setting up different committees, but um, ultimately the governor comes out and says, this is what happened. So my, my guess is that there's a lot of talk internally and they're talking with some folks, um, you know, on the ground, but ultimately it's, uh, it, it, there's no sort of, there's no committee, there's no where that uh, the public could come and make comments and say, this is how we think it went. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we're, we're amazingly used up a, a lot of our, our time already, but I just want to ask uh, 
maybe partly in closing, are there things any of you think um, that that ought to be happening to increase turnout, to uh, to increase confidence in the election um, results, either in the the short term by to have an impact on November or or beyond that? And I guess behind that question is is everything so unique with with COVID nineteen that 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 we're all sort of muddling our way through now and hoping to emerge on the other side. Michael, your mic. Can you, you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, based on what uh, some of the voters have said and, and reaction of the voters in terms of those who have been receiving the mail-in ballots and based on the experience of what county clerks and administrators or boards of elections uh, have told us about this particular race, they've expressed so much exasperation with having to do so much in so short a time to get people um, uh, the knowledge they need to cast a vote. And I just hope that between now and whenever uh, a decision is made and that a decision is made quickly based on the best evidence that the state has from this primary election, that it gives, that the process will give election officials and certainly the opportunity to be educated on how to do this so that it minimizes confusion and people know what they're doing. You know, to Patricia's point, when I was at the poll last week and I didn't see a whole lot of people voting physically and in person at one of the uh, voting places in Elizabeth, but one of the voters there, uh, a Latina, uh, came out of the, the voting booth and, uh, and I asked her how to vote. And, uh, and she said she voted by a provisional ballot. And I wanted to talk to her about that. She told me she received a mail-in ballot, but it was just, uh, in, in the return, it was just too much. And she said, so I'm going to come and vote in person. So um, I suspect there is a lot of that because, uh, again, if you look in Union County, uh, Nicole Dorado, they just received tons of provisional ballots. And it's just, it, it, in so many words, she said, it's just exasperating the thought of having to go through all of those and to vet those. So they're hoping that they, at, at least the election officials will have more time to educate the public and that people will know what the process is. Uh, I wanted to close with, um, with saying that um, I do worry as an advocate uh, for um, working people's issues, for um, minority issues in the state that um, as we enter this very worrisome economic period, there's other people, there's other issues that people are concerned about. And if they don't, if we don't really do the hard work of engaging them and educating them to vote, they won't see voting as the solution to the economic crisis that we're facing as a country. So one option that voters always have, um, I, I said earlier that uh, the Democrats um, and, and Republicans are counting on Trump uh, driving um, mobilization on either side, specifically on Latino voters. But one choice is for people not to vote. And I think that in the disfranchised communities uh, of immigrants and Latinos, that's a real choice. And that if we do not push our political leaders to invest in the, in the education part of voting, that we will have an outcome that it will be just worsened for our communities of color in terms of the policy solutions that they need to get out of this economic stagnation we're all in. So I just hope um, that's sort of like my call for action, right? How do we educate voters? Whatever the process is, there has to be an investment in education and outreach directed at those communities by validators of those communities. Two um, questions raised. One on social media and how to get to the hard to reach voters. I, I said I would suggest that um, the League of Women Voters meet them where they are. Go to those um, uh, platforms, whether it's TikTok or Instagram, where these individuals are, and also connect with the people who influence them. So there are these influencers, whether it's a YouTube influencer or an influencer on Instagram, connect with them and have them communicate to their audience to support um, your program. Um, and, and the second point on voter suppression. In, in Inglewood, in I worked at the DNC during the time uh, when the, the Russians hacked the Democratic Party 
and, and then certainly there's vote. evidence that there was voter um, suppression. It, it I don't think that will be an issue here in New Jersey. Voter suppression will not be the issue. The issue will be disenfranchisement. And so, so the, the, the issue for the day for the for the, the, the governor and the party leaders, how do we make sure that voters um, want to receive the education they need to understand what is happening, um, when they can vote, how they can vote, and then ensure that there's a, a, a mechanism in place to turn out the vote. So I think that is the, that should be the focus for all who are concerned about making sure that um, if the, the incumbents stay in office or those who are you know, challenging incumbents are successful. To communicate to that network and bring all of them together to educate the public. But if we don't do this granular organizing and mobilizing, we are going to come up short in this election cycle. Yeah, I, you know, in, to Marilyn's point, I'm thinking that maybe um, uh, the way that we've been doing census outreach, uh, there are a lot of grassroots organizations working on that. Perhaps that's a way to, um, you know, to use that kind of effort as well to, to just um direct it toward voting because i can tell you that um i know that all of the county well at least many of the counties have put together videos to show people how to use the vote by mail um, we actually did one too with njtv um so there were some materials out there but i just don't know that they were getting to people who really needed to see them yep yep and to make things more complicated or more difficult some of the comments that come in um one is all old forms of advertising are important since not not all the population has internet access, particularly minority communities. Internet and social community is something we take for granted and it is not. And another person wrote in COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting African Americans and Latinos. This will indeed affect our, our representation at the polls as well. To that, to that point, I would say what will definitely influence how people vote in November is how states and how our elected officials in New Jersey respond to the challenges of COVID and the uh, recession. And I think there's a lot of concern <laughs> about, you know, this is an unprecedented challenge, an unprecedented moment. I'm not sure that we're seeing unprecedented policy response right now. I'm not sure that we're seeing people yes. understand the magnitude of what it is that we are facing right now. And we're hearing a lot of the same old business as usual. Oh, it's just another recession. No, this is not just another recession. No, this is not just another crisis. This is, you know, three crises hitting us at one. This is a health crisis, this is an economic crisis, and then also the crisis of people taking to the streets to fight against systemic racism. And people want to see the representatives actually acknowledge that and do something about it for once. And if they don't do something about it and they don't respond uh, fully to the moment, you're going to have a lot of people opt out of the system, opt out of the process. And obviously that can be counterintuitive in a number of ways, but it's hard to blame them when the folks who have you know, fought for their vote and who have said, I'm going to re represent you and I'm going to make sure I fight for your family when the when the time comes to do so. And now is the time more than ever to show that we're still getting the same old, same old. So if folks want people to come out here and vote in November, they need to show that they deserve that vote now. And the parties need to show that they deserve that vote now. <clears throat> Any, anyone else want to chime in before we close for the day? I would say uh, Colleen mentioned that maybe it's part of her job as a reporter to be cynical. Um, I think part of our goal, at least at the Hilton Institute, is to, to help people move from being cynical to being skeptical and uh, to to then invest in, in education and, and turning out to vote and understanding the issues and so forth. But but thank you all for, for illuminating this conversation and making it possible. I appreciate your time and then to those watching at home. I hope you found it interesting and uh, thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Stay healthy. <laughs>